Hi, and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Jennifer Bergen, and I'm so happy to have you join us today. It has been since last year that we were all together, and it is so good to kick off 2021's Explore Classroom with all you amazing kids, teachers, and families. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change the world. This Explorer Classroom YouTube show connects students around the world with our National Geographic Explorers for short lessons and time for your questions. Today, our Explorer is Anusha Shankar. Anusha is a biologist who researches how hummingbirds thrive and balance their energy needs. She is especially enjoying learning about hummingbirds' torpid state, something they do to save energy at night. Anusha uses an infrared camera to capture the amazing things hummingbirds can do in their sleep, including preening, snoring, and even going potty. Anusha has been doing field work in Ecuador, working closely with Ecuadorian hummingbird experts. She's also a Rose postdoctoral fellow at Cornell and uses this opportunity to study hummingbirds in the United States. Besides being a huge fan of hummingbirds, Anusha enjoys being a mentor to beginning scientists, salsa dancing, photography, and reading fiction stories. But before we get into today's lesson, let's welcome all the friends joining us from around the world. Wherever you may be, Give a little cheer when you hear your state, country, school, or class. Welcome to our friends in Virginia, Connecticut, Vermont, Indiana, Georgia, Idaho, Nevada, Wisconsin, California, and New York. The United States of America, India, Pakistan, Canada, Argentina, and Germany. Also, shout outs to Naomi, Miss Binu's family, Hajra, the Myers family, Parkway Elementary School, St. Stephen's and St. Agnes's School, Carmel DeMar, Douglas Park School, and St. Daniel Comboni. And with that, let's get this Explorer classroom started. It's time to turn it over to Anusha to share about hummingbirds. Take it away, Anusha. Hi everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I have been studying hummingbirds for eight years now, and I've learned a lot about them, and I'm really excited to share what I've learned with you. I'll start by sharing my screen. Um, just give me one minute while I make this big so I can see it and see you. Is that good? Okay, awesome. Um, let me tell you a little bit about where I came from so that you have some context about how a hummingbird biologist becomes a hummingbird biologist. This is me when I, I was about two or three years old, maybe a little younger than you guys are now. And I grew up, I spent a lot of my time growing up in India, uh, where a lot of my family is. Uh, this is me I teaching my grandfather how to dance on the left and playing with my family outside and being really happy being outside. I want you guys to think about all the time that you spend outside. Um, how, many time, how many times do you go outside to play? And how many times a week do you go outside to play? What animals do you see when you go outside to play? These are the kinds of things I want you to keep in mind um, that we can talk about at the end. I want to start with just taking a moment, maybe closing your eyes and thinking about the, all the kinds of different animals that are on earth, okay? Just think about four different animals that you've seen on this planet, in whatever country, in whatever city or state or zoo, okay? Okay, you can open your eyes because I'm gonna show you some pictures. I am just amazed that there are giraffes on this planet and blue whales and ostriches okay, and ants. It's just amazing to me to sit down sometimes and remember that all of these animals share this planet with us. I've spent some of my time studying these animals because I wanna know how they work and I wanna know how animals are able to exist and use all kinds of different forests and deserts and oceans and landscapes all over the world. 
So I spent some time studying king cobras in India. We put what are called radio telemeters on them. So they'll ping us where, where to tell us where the snake is and we can follow them and see whether they're using farms or whether they're near people's houses or whether they're in a forest and we can see how they use different habitats. But while I was studying those snakes, I also took a lot of photos of all kinds of animals in the same area. So there were ants, there were butterflies, there were spiders, there were snakes, other snakes, there were grasses and plants and insects. There's just so many things that are alive around us if we pay attention to them, right? I also spent a lot of time photographing butterflies and bugs and birds like this. You can see the bug on the left over the bottom here is laying eggs. I found it while it was laying eggs. There's this beautiful butterfly called a map butterfly, which we find in India, which is almost kind of like a map, but it's also translucent, meaning you can see through its wings to the other side. But I was here in this, at this time when I was photographing these other animals, I was studying these giant birds called hornbills. How many of you have heard of toucans? Raise your hands. Toucans. Okay, toucans are giant, a lot of you haven't, but toucans are giant birds and they're in North and South America, like in the US, not in the US, in South America, sorry, not North America. And they have giant beaks and they eat fruits mostly. And very similar to toucans, there are hornbills in India. And this is a hornbill in the middle. They have giant beaks, they crush fruits, and they also eat insects and, and snakes and other things, but their main thing is to eat fruits. And I was studying these, these hornbills in India. How many of you know what these are? Raise your hands. Some of you, some of you. This is, uh, these are hummingbirds. So these are two hummingbirds that I photographed in Ecuador in South America. And this is what I spent a lot of time studying. So I'm amazed that hummingbirds exist. How many of you know how big a hummingbird is? Can you just point out with your, with your fingers, like, are they this big, this big, this big, this big? Some of you are very close, yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of different types of hummingbirds, but this is the smallest one. This is called a bee hummingbird, and you can find it just on the island of Cuba. And it weighs about the same as an American dime. It weighs more than a Canadian dime. I know, I know there's some Canadians out here. I don't want to leave you out. So, these hummingbirds are really, really small. This hummingbird is like that big. It could sit on the top of a pencil. Um, but they're using up energy super, super fast. I know the screen is black, don't freak out. They're using up energy so quickly and flying so fast that if we used up energy as quickly as them, we'd have to eat a ton. We'd have to eat 300 hamburgers every single day to be able to survive like hummingbirds do if we used up energy like they did. So that's a lot of energy. You get your energy from food. They get that energy from sugar water, from plants, and by eating insects sometimes. And they have to eat a lot to stay alive. And somehow, even though they need so much energy, they survive in the rainforests, like you see here, in the deserts, in the high elevation mountains in South America, which get really cold at night. So there's all these different kinds of places that they're able to survive, even though they need so much energy. And there's more than 330 different types or species of hummingbirds. There's these really colorful hummingbirds called the crimson topazes. There's my favorite, the little booted racket tail. There's the bee hummingbird, which I just showed you earlier. There's the sword billed hummingbird, which has, you know why it's called a sword bill. It has a giant sword-like bill that's longer than its body. The bill is another word for beak. So this is a giant sword billed hummingbird. This is the giant hummingbird. So it's just about the size of, a, of the palm of this human, but it's the biggest of all hummingbirds. And it's like nine times as big as the tiny little bee hummingbird. So there's so many different types of hummingbird uh, species. And one thing I do is to study how they use their energy. So if you've seen your parents might have Fitbits on, how many of your parents have like watches with activity trackers on them? Some of you, yeah. So the, what they're using it for is to see how much uh, energy they're using up or how much they're being active during the day. They want to know how many steps they've taken or something like that. That's kind of what I want to do for, with hummingbirds. But if we put Fitbits on them, they would just fall off. Hummingbirds are so small and we don't have small enough Fitbits for hummingbirds. So instead, we have to do other things to, to study how they use energy. 
And one way is to catch them. We have to go through a lot of training and get a lot of permissions from important people who know what they're doing to be able to do this. So you can't just go out and catch hummingbirds, but we are able to get trained to catch them. And we use these things called feeder traps. So there's a nectar feeder in the middle and we gently go and take the hummingbird out when it comes and visits this feeder. And then they look like this. And I'll show you a few videos to show you some of the color variation you can see in hummingbirds. So this is an incredible feature they have. Some of their feathers, when you see them from one angle, they look like they're one color. And when you see them from another angle, they look like they're a different color. So the one on the left, you can see, it looks very gray right now. And then when it turns its head, it, it's blue. It's like secret colors that are hiding in there. And on the right, you can see it looks black in some angles, but that little chin part looks purple in other angles. So they have what's called iridescence, meaning that depending on the, the angle that the feathers are at, they look like they're different colors. And that also, this is what was really amazing to me. At night, they use this strategy called topper, like Ms. Bergen was saying in the beginning. They are able to shut themselves down and save a lot of energy because otherwise they wouldn't be able to make it through the whole night and survive to the next day. They use that energy so fast and they can't feed at night when it's all dark and they can't see their food. So they shut down and use this strategy called torpor. And what torpor means is um, that they're becoming cold and they're basically shutting down a lot of their body's processes and saving a bunch of energy. So it's like, you don't wanna leave your car on when you're not using it, right? You turn it off. And so then the car isn't taking up gas and wasting energy. And so you're able to save the gas in the car for the next time that you're gonna use your car. And it's the same with our laptops that we power them down or we put them in hibernate or in sleep mode. Hummingbirds are doing an extreme version of this when they use torpor. And we studied this by using thermal cameras or cameras that can see heat. So this is the camera over here. Let me point to it over here and over here. And it's pointed at these tiny little hummingbirds that you can see in the little chamber we've made. And we get images like this. How many of you know, raise your hands, what this hummingbird is doing? Ms. Bergen gave you a little hint in the beginning. <laughs> maybe, maybe some of you. Okay, so this is a hummingbird in a thermal image. And this is the eye right here. It's the, the whiter parts are like the really, really warm. Oh, the whiter parts are the really, really warm parts. And the, the purple parts are the cooler parts. So this is the eye of the hummingbird. This is its beak. This is its tail. And this is pee. The hummingbird is peeing and we captured that on camera. So we're able to see all kinds of interesting behaviors by using these thermal cameras. And this is a video, hopefully you can see it now, um, of a hummingbird that is breathing and its heart is beating and its body is at, at a really warm temperature and it's using up a lot of energy, but it's asleep, its eyes are closed. So here, this is the eye, it's super warm and red. And then I'm gonna show you another video and this doesn't really look like a video at all, but I promise it is. This is a video of a hummingbird in torpor. And its body is basically the same temperature as the outside air, it's so cold. And it's saving a lot of energy. It's like 40 Fahrenheit or something like that. It's, it's really cold. Um, and it's barely moving and it's barely breathing because its body is so shut down. And that's what torpor looks like with these thermal um, cameras. So you can imagine that if a hummingbird is just sitting there, then maybe predators can come and eat it, or it doesn't have enough energy to warm itself back up in the morning. So topper can be dangerous. Um, whereas if it doesn't use topper, then it can respond if there's like something coming to eat it. So there's, there's, there's a cost and a benefit to using topper, and they have to be careful and decide which one is more important. They also do fun stuff like, this is what preening is. It's basically like arranging your feathers. And even though its eyes are closed and it looks like it's asleep, it's preening in the night. And like I said, they also pee. This is just a video on loop. It's not peeing again and again, but I like watching it. Um, this is a hummingbird peeing at night. So, okay, what can you all do? One, if you see animals around you, just ask questions about them. Like, how is it able to do this? Or how is it able to fly like that? Or how is a eagle fly, flying different from a hummingbird flying? Like they, they use their wings very, very differently. Um, find interesting things around you, like 
I was amazed when I was in India and I watched the sun move, the sun kind of goes overhead in the middle of the day, right? But if you come further and further north, like you, like we are, like I am in Virginia right now, or if I go even further north to like Alaska or parts of Canada, the sun never quite goes overhead in the winter. It's always kind of closer to the horizon. So pay attention to the things around you and see patterns and ask, why is it doing that? And why is it different in this new place? If you go somewhere on vacation, that's warmer or further south, pay attention to the sun. Uh, pay attention to the plants around you. There's so many different types of plants and there's all kinds of different leaf shapes. Why do they have different leaf shapes? Like there's just endless questions once you start going outside. I, you're at the perfect age when I know you're already doing this, so there's really no point telling you, but keep doing that is what I want to tell you. Um, look at the animals around you and try to find maybe similarities between what the animals are doing and what you're doing. Where do animals sleep? Where do I sleep? How do they sleep? <laughs> like, what do they do when they're asleep? That's one of the things I've clearly been asking. Um, and just pay, in general, attention to the diversity and the incredible like differences between all of the animals in this world around you and keep asking questions about them. Okay, I'll take some of your questions now. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Anusha. Thank you so much for sharing all of that incredible video footage. And just the things that you shared are so inspiring. We've already gotten a ton of wonderful questions from YouTube and I cannot wait to start asking them. So friends, this is the best part. It's time for questions. If you're watching online, send us your questions in the chat bar. We record all the questions that get sent in. So you only need to ask each question once. Um, if you're an on-screen guest, get ready with a nice loud voice and I will tell you when it is your turn. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started with on-screen guests and we've got Mrs. Mangali Soto's class coming in from Toronto. So Mrs. Mangali Soto, which first grader would like to ask a question? Hi friends, I want to say I'm so glad that we finally have National Geographic back. Um, I'm going to call on Serena. Serena, are you ready? Yeah, there you go. Where do hummingbirds go in the winter? Ah, that's such a clever question. Um, so in when they're in South America, they just stay there most of the time. But the ones in the US go to Central and South America. So they go to Mexico, or they go to Guatemala, or they go to Ecuador or Colombia and all these countries further south because it gets too cold and there's not enough food and not enough flowering plants for them to feed on. That's a great question. And then they come back and they have babies when they're here. Anusha, we have a, a question coming in on YouTube from Miss Shepherd's class. And they wanna know, how can such a tiny bird get enough energy? Yeah, that's a great question too. So they feed um, every 15 minutes sometimes. Um, and Usually they don't go during the day without feeding for two hours or more. They, they feed less, more frequently than that. So it's just like a lots in, lots out kind of strategy. Whereas we limit ourselves to three meals a day because we don't need to constantly feed all the time. We would just like balloon um, beyond capacity if we, if, we, if we ate too much. Let's go to another on-screen guest. I'd like to welcome Sam coming in from Virginia. Turn on your microphone, Sam, and make sure your voice is loud and clear. How do the hummingbirds eat? How do they eat? Oh my God, there's so many cool videos. If you Google hummingbird tongues later, don't do it right now, but you can see how hummingbirds feed. So they, they have this like fork in their tongue and there's some researchers that have so, Film them in super slow-mo so you can see exactly how the tongue comes out of the mouth and picks up nectar and pulls it back in. So they have like a forked tongue and it has a lot of little hair things on them and that can hold nectar and pull it back into their mouth. And so they, they, they have really long tongues and really long beaks too. And it depends on the flower shape, their beak shape matches the flower shape so they can really get into the nectar and take it out. That's an excellent question. You should check that out afterwards. And that is such a cool adaptation. 
We've got another question from a YouTuber named Kenzie, and Kenzie's asking, what colors can hummingbirds see? So that, that's, all of these are excellent questions, and this is what people are spending like decades of their lives trying to figure out. It's not a simple one, but recently some researchers from Princeton, I think, um, did some experiments to see which colors hummingbirds could see and which colors they preferred. Um, and they can see a lot more colors than we can. Like most birds, they have an extra type of uh, sensor in their eye that's, that can see ultraviolet um, apart from the colors that we can see. So they can see way more than we can see. They can see all of these like hidden colors and flowers that we can't. Whoa. Let's go to another on-screen guest. I'd like to welcome the Potter family. The Potters are coming in from Vermont. So go ahead and turn on your microphone. Um, how many wings do hummingbird wings vibrate a second? How many times? Times. That's a great question. Um, and I'm really bad at remembering it off the top of my head. I think, a second. Is it 30 to 50 beats a second? Something, it's like some ridiculously fast amount. Like you can't even see them. You have to slow it down and use those slow motion cameras to be able to see. And depending on the hummingbird type and its size, it, its wings move at a different speed. So like the really tiny ones, they move even faster. And the really, really big ones, like the giant hummingbird that I showed you, the one that, that's like the size of the, the person's hand, those move much slower. So it depends on the size of the hummingbird too. Great question. A YouTuber named Connor has, uh, this is exactly what I was thinking. If the bee hummingbird is the smallest hummingbird, then how small are its eggs? I don't know. I've never seen the bee hummingbird in person. I mean, they usually say that hummingbird eggs are tic tac sized. So that's pretty small. But the bee hummingbird, I don't know, maybe it's smaller than that. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Nests are not all that easy to find. So there are people who are really good at it. Maybe they've been around you and you haven't seen them because they're that teeny. <laughs> We're going to go to another friend from Virginia who's on screen with us. Let's welcome Nate. Nate, turn on your microphone and ask your question loud and clear. Why are they called hummingbirds? Do they hum? Very good question. Um, I don't know if I know for sure, but when, when they're flying past you, you can definitely hear like a buzzing sound. You can tell, mm, 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 but they're so fast that you'll only hear it for a second or two. Some of them though, like when, when the male is trying to signal to the female, some species will make like a shrill sound with their wings. Like they'll have this little space between their feathers that'll make them go. <laughs> so they can do other like cool things. Um, Depends, different types can do different, diff, make different kinds of sounds. They don't, unlike other birds, they don't make very many sounds with their mouth, like with their bills, with their beaks. But um, yeah, their wings in general make a little humming sound when they go past you. I think that's why they're called hummingbirds. Two of our YouTubers have interconnected questions. So Kylie is asking, is it possible for a hummingbird to hurt a person? And then Abby is wondering, how can we catch hummingbirds without hurting them? So talk about those two concepts. Hummingbirds, I don't think it's, I haven't heard about hummingbirds hurting people because they're so small and they do kind of give you that sound when they're approaching you. So it's hard for them to sneak up on you really. Um, there are, I think, legends and myths that they can poke your eyes or, I don't know, do all kinds of strange things, but I don't think they're really true. Um, they can hurt each other. They can poke at each other's eyes. They're quite aggressive. You think they're like cute and tiny, but they can, they can be aggressive to each other for sure. Um, how do you catch one without hurting them? So we, like I said, we have to go through all this training to be able to do that. But there's two ways mainly. One is to put these nets, these really fine nets up between two poles. And the, they have little like bag kind of things. So the hummingbirds fly into them and then we gently have to take them out. There's like an order. First you have to do the head, then you have to, first you have to do the legs, then you have to work your way up to the head. Um, so that's one way. And the other way is the, are these feeder traps. 
So you hummingbirds come to feeders where there's nectar in them and you can put up this mesh trap around them. And when they sit on the feeder and they start feeding, you drop that mesh around them. And so they don't get entangled or anything. You can just put your hand in and take them out really gently. And that's how we catch them. Let's go to one of our on-screen guests. We have another classroom coming in from Canada. Let's welcome Mrs. Wilsey and Ms. S's class. And teachers, let us know who wants to ask a question on behalf of the group. Hi, it's Ms. S here. So we had a student, uh, Wanushka. She's um, uh, having a little bit trouble with her mic. So I'm gonna ask her question for her. Uh, a couple questions posed were already asked. So here's one, where do they go at night? So we're in Canada, so we see them just usually in the summertime. Where do they go at nighttime? That's a good question. So you, the ones in Canada, are you on the East Coast? On the, on the West, okay. Um, so you might get a few different species. The ones we get on the East Coast are ruby-throated hummingbirds and they're like three grams. And the ones on the West Coast are probably Anna's hummingbirds and there's also Rufus. So there are a few different sizes. And depending on the size, they use more topper or less topper. But in all cases, they kind of want to be hidden because they don't want to get eaten by things in the night. So the, you usually won't find them outside in the open. And if you do, that's not a good thing. They're probably not doing very well. But so they usually go to trees and they hide in, in the middle of branches. And where you get them in the summer, usually they'll be nesting. And so very often the females, they're the only ones that nest. The females will be on the nests taking care of the eggs of the little chicks. And the males will probably just be in the trees somewhere and hiding in, in a branch. I, I don't see hummingbirds outside very often at night. It's really hard to find them at night. And that's what they want. They don't want to be really easy to find at night. A YouTuber Riley wants to know, is there evidence that hummingbirds have dreams? <laughs> so how do we figure out that something dreams? One way is to ask, like we can ask each other, did you dream, did I dream? And we can't do that with hummingbirds. Um, so the only other way to figure out is to use fancy machines, like there are things called EEGs, electroencephalograms. And they, they have like those, in those sci-fi movies, they, they put like electrodes on the person's brain and they're able to study the brain wave patterns. So if we were able to do that with hummingbirds, we would be able to figure that out. But there's no EEG small enough to put on a little hummingbird skull. Um, from watching them at night, I think they, I think they dream. Like when, when we watch them with these thermal videos, they do like twitchy things, like I think humans do, and they they like move around in kind of strange ways. And I I feel like they must be dreaming, but we don't know. Well, Riley, you might need to start doing some research and then join a new show one day in the field and find this out once and for all. <laughs> We're going to go to another on-screen guest. I'd like to welcome the Murphy family, also from Virginia. Murphy family, turn on your microphone. Can hummingbirds be only one color? There are a lot of hummingbirds that are just green but even they're usually different types of green. Um, I'm trying to think, other than green, I don't, there's, there's some which are more gray, but they usually have a little bit of purple here or a little streak of white near the eye. There's very few hummingbirds that are just one color. We've got a class on YouTube. Miss um, G's class wants to know, how long on average does a hummingbird live? That's a great question. So usually as an animal, as an animal type gets smaller and smaller, it lives shorter and shorter lives. And the, like elephants live really long, humans live pretty long and little tiny animals like mice don't live very long. So it's really surprising that hummingbirds can live seven and sometimes 12 years. I think the longest a hummingbird has been known to live is 12 years. Um, but the average I think is about seven years. And they know this because they catch hummingbirds every year and put little tiny, aluminum bands on them with numbers on them. And so they can identify a hummingbird individual and they'll know how many times they've recaught it. And so sometimes they found this one that was recaught 12 years after it was first caught. Um, but it is kind of surprising. I think book could be one reason that they're able to live so long because they can kind of save energy and time by shutting down at night and then like, surviving longer overall. That's a great question. I think there's a lesson for people in this. We've got to rest sometimes. Help us do more for work. Sure. 
little hummingbirds. Well, Anusha, we're headed towards the end of our show. So for our last question, how can we take on your mission as an explorer and become better at observing nature? That's a good question. Um, I, like I was saying, I think just spend time outside. Um, if you can spend one or two hours outside every week and ask questions about the animals around you and try to find out the answers, I think you start appreciating how much nature has to offer us and how much amazing stuff there is in the world out there. Um, and I think no matter what you end up doing with your time or whatever path you end up choosing, um, if you appreciate what nature does for itself, for us, for all the animals that we have around us, um, I think that's, that's the mission. Um, just ask a lot of questions and spend time outside. Absolutely. Gratitude is such an important practice and you're inspiring me to be more grateful for even just my backyard birds. Well, friends, I bet many of you are interested in more opportunities after hearing from Anusha and just getting so much incredible information. So check out Explore Classroom again and note that we have a lot of opportunities. They're free, they're amazing, they're educational, and they're all at natgeoed.org. So I hope you join us for more events in the future. Speaking of, next week, we're going to be connecting with Explorer Siobhan Parusna. He is awesome. Um, he studies sun gazer lizard, lizards. So our Explorer Classroom program with him will be next Monday. It's for ages four to eight, and it'll be at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there's also more episodes for ages nine through 14 on Thursdays. That's at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can register a student group, your family, yourself, and you can also apply to be featured like our on-screen guest today by going to natgeoed.org backslash explore classroom. So friends, have a great day. Stay curious, keep exploring. We'll see you next time. And if you're on screen, turn on your microphone and tell Anusha